as has been stated before, this is a period of Bible study. It is not a period to try and set policy for the church. We can't do that. But we can study the Bible through the avenue of questions. If uh, we want to make an open forum, that means others can talk other than just uh, Lynn Parker, who's going to be in charge of it. But if you want to add comments uh, or um, whatever you want to say, come to the podium and state your name and where you're from, and that way, and then uh, make whatever comments that you would like to make. That way it uh, is kept decently in order. Don't uh, try and speak from where you're sitting because people over the internet are uh, watching can't hear you and when we archive these and people go back later on to view it they won't be able to hear you so be sure and come to the podium and brother Lynn well I fully realize that there are those uh, here present that would be much better doing this than I would and uh, much more um, uh, adept. Still, I'll do the best job that I can, and I'll expect you to help me out. How about that? And if I'm wrong on something, well, you'll be my friend if you'll point out uh, that I'm wrong. At the same time, there are some issues, some of the questions that have been brought up that no doubt we'll have some disagreement on. Uh, three minutes before we started this session, Michael and I had already disagreed on my answer to one of these questions. And uh, it... It just points out that among brethren who love one another, Michael can be wrong. Uh, <laughs> it's okay if you're wrong. <laughs> uh, but, but still, we'll do the best job that we can. And uh, I'll try to do the best job that I can, and you help me out on this. Well, here are several questions. I know that we're not going to get to all these on this list, but um, I picked the ones that I wanted to answer, and the hard ones I left for somebody else. I, I don't mind telling you. All right. Would you name in order the books of the New Testament? Yes, I will. Matthew, Mark. That's not one. That's not one of them. Here it is. What is so wrong with having a glass of wine with your meal? You're not getting drunk, and it does not even have the alcoholic content of cough syrup. Well, I looked at a couple of those. And I'm somewhat familiar with people that drink alcohol. I see that from time to time. Uh, in my secular vocation, I come across people, not so much anymore because... Um, I'm not out on the street quite as much as I used to be uh, on patrol, but still see people from time to time that um, uh, have had what we call legally too much to drink. At the same time, biblically, whenever they drink one drink, they're one drink drunk. And I stand uh, behind that. I know some brethren don't like that statement. and Some have uh, stated that before. They take objection to it, but I can prove it. And I can prove it not only from a biblical standpoint, but also from a medical standpoint. And I wish I had my file um, on alcoholic beverages because in my file there, some years ago anticipating this, and because some brethren had objected to that particular stand, they had said this, that, uh, well, you can't prove that a person is drunk with one drink. Well, we then need to go back, and first of all, we establish from Galatians chapter 5, the works of the flesh, among those other things stated, drunkenness. Bible teaches if you're a drunk, you're not going to go to heaven. Need we say more about that? And a lot of our brethren, as a matter of fact, I don't know of anybody that disagrees with that statement. They'll say, that's right. If you're a drunk, you're not going to go to heaven, and the Bible teaches against drunkenness. I've never had anybody object to that. Well, what they disagree with is the definition that we're setting forth as far as drunkenness here. Too many people believe that drunkenness is what the state of Florida or the state of Texas sets forth. In Texas, we have a blood alcohol content of presumed intoxication at 0 .08 BAC, blood alcohol content. And so if a person has that amount of alcohol in their system while they're operating a motor vehicle in a public place, uh, there doesn't have to be on they say public road. It's not public road anymore. A few years ago, Texas legislature changed that, so now it can be a private place that uh, or privately owned parking lot or road that's open to the public, like a Walmart parking lot. That's still a place where you cannot drive while intoxicated without uh, being arrested. 
So anyway, uh, this translates to an average sized person, uh, an average sized man, because men and women, male and female, um, metabolize and they, they then fall under the influence of alcohol at a little bit different rates uh, there. And so anyway, um, it would be about four beers or four mixed drinks in a short period of time where they would accumulate a 0.02 blood alcohol content, that percentage as they go up. And then if a person gets to a certain level, uh, we have a policy that we have to call the uh, emergency medical service before we can even jail them. And the jailers will not take them. Uh, anything that's above 0 .30, uh, we cannot jail them until they've been medically examined because it's a real bummer the next morning to go in there and find that your drunk is dead. And of course, some and some people will do any do anything to get out of going to court uh, there. But still, it does tend to put a damper on your entire day. I've never had that happen. I've heard of it happening a few times. The, uh, the highest level I've ever seen was of all people a gynecologist. I arrested him uh, then many years ago. He'd already lost his medical license. He was driving drunk at about four miles an hour on US 290 outside of Johnson City, Texas, and he checked on the on the intoxilizer at that time a point four one. I had never seen anything like that in my life. And, and uh, oh, of course you're going to say that you've seen one that's higher. <laughs> If I said 0.70, you'd say, yeah, but you had a 0.71. So anyway, <laughs> and so we had, we, we had to have that man examined. Now, we, we go through this, and I'm not saying this either to, uh, to tout myself, just to, uh, to let you know where I'm coming from. I'm recognized uh, from, uh, and not only as an intoxilizer operator, I'm not active right now, but I have been through the Texas DPS intoxilizer operator school and uh, have a certificate and then recognized as a standardized field sobriety tester by the Department of Transportation, also uh, Texas Law Enforcement Commission. So I, I, I do see people like this and whenever we're giving them tests, one of the things that we do is, is among other things, you know, the, the, um, uh, the, the skip um, down the road, a jump over backwards, do a backflip uh, back to your car and things like that. The different agility tests that we give them, that's not exactly the way it goes. But well, we give them a horizontal gaze of staticness. And if you've ever seen police officers on the side of the road with their pins out and they're facing someone, you just see that they'll take their ink pins out. What they're doing is checking horizontal gaze and staticness. And that nystagmus is looking for people who have a jerking of the eyes. And we'll bring these eyes all the way out here and say, don't move your head, just follow with your eyes. And then when it starts jerking going back, it's because the influence of, of a substance there. And of course, usually the case is alcohol. It's interesting that whenever we were testing on that in the school to learn to be standardized field sobriety testers, we could see the, the jerking of the eyes start well before the presumed Texas limit. Now, I'm bringing that all up to say this, that I wrote to two different um, medical examiners. They're the doctors that are going to look at you when it's too late to cure you. All right, they're going to perform the autopsies on people. And these two medical examiners, one in Nueces County, uh, Texas, and one in Bear County, Texas, were asked, among other things, this question. Does drunkenness occur at a certain point, or is it then a matter of degree? And the clearest answer coming back from one of them uh, there, where he really addressed it, he said, drunkenness is then a matter of degree, and it starts with the first drink. I mean, you can't, you can't have somebody at .08 until they got to .07. And you can't get there unless you're at point oh six and on and on. And so then, when the Bible sets forth that you can't be drunk, drunkenness is sin, drunkenness keeps you out of heaven, then brethren, it's an ironclad argument that cannot be defeated. It really cannot. And I didn't invent this or anything else. But it's just the way it is. It's a fact that if drunkenness is condemned and drunkenness begins with the first drink, then one person, a person being one drink drunk, still incurs the wrath of heaven. And all of this, um, uh, well, what about medicinal use and everything else, is just so much of a smoke screen. I know people say, well, you go over here to Paul's first letter to Timothy, use a little wine for thy stomach's sake, and thine often infirmities. If he was then talking about the same kind of wine 
that we're talking about today. And you know, people make a mistake whenever they say wine. 2010, that means what's sold in the bottle up there on the shelf gets people drunk, uh, all, all this other stuff. Uh, the winos have in their back pocket are... are that, that is not doing justice as a good Bible student. Because in the Old Testament, for example, the prophet is going to speak about the wine that hangs in the cluster. So if we're going to go and research words, we, it comes with poor grace for us to then say that uh, because the word, the way we use it today in America at this time, means this, it always meant that biblically. And that's just not true. So we're going to have to go back and we're going to have to research the words. We're also going to have to research the context in which the words are used whenever wine, for example, appears. I believe that we could show with very, very credible evidence that there was a substance that was produced as a result of boiling down grape juice. Oftentimes it would ferment then. You need certain things. You need uh, the yeast and you need the... Uh, the sugar that takes place, there are naturally occurring sugars in grape juice, surely, and there is yeast that can uh, then appear. You can have an intoxicating beverage as a result of that being in some animal skins and carried along. But the fact is that they knew how to get rid of that, and they viewed the good wine, John chapter 2, they viewed the good wine as being that which was destitute of spirits and was essentially just fresh grape juice without any intoxicant um, quality at all. One of the good books, by the way, to establish that is an old one from the 1800s, Patton's Bible Wines. Really, a little bitty book. I think it's still in print. And it's, uh, it, it ought to have uh, um, good reception by brethren who want to know the truth on this. Those folks, centuries ago, no more or knew more than what we think. Because they didn't have a refrigerator, doesn't mean they didn't have some type of refrigeration. That is to seal them in clay jars, put it under a, a cold stream or down in a well, keep it from uh, uh, growing intoxicated and sour. And also they learned to boil it down. But back to my story here for just a moment. And they would take then this boiled down, uh, as they boiled it in the evening, they'd take it and, and they would then find that it was losing water, of course, whenever you boil it. And also when you subject it to heat, what else do you lose but the alcoholic content? And so you're losing the alcohol, you're losing the water, eventually you get a thick paste. And this thick paste from grapes was still referred to by at least some as wine. There's a little bit of debate on that, but guess what it was used for? Nausea. Take a little wine for that stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. But you know, if that was wine like people use today, if it was, it still would not justify social drinking. It still wouldn't do it. Any more than getting an anesthesia before you have surgery justifies the recreational or the social injection. You know, uh, did you bring your morphine tonight, Brother Paul? How about let's just go and each have our own syringe full of morphine tonight? Uh, no more than one or two because we're just social morphine users. <laughs> well, you, you, you see my point. And so, no, um, it's not right for Christians to drink socially. It's not right for Christians to drink alcoholic beverages uh, then with their meals or anything else. And the Bible teaches that such is sin. And we feel very confident uh, in that, despite the fact that a whole bunch of brethren don't believe that any longer. And they don't practice it. And it's just simply amazing to hear of brethren that some of which who hold to the truth on the one church in the New Testament and um, the purpose for baptism, and yet they will teach that um, you can go and you can have a drink. Now, I want to, and to back that up, I'm not creating a straw man. It was just within the last 90 days that I got a call from a brother uh, who is also in law enforcement, but he's a brother out in uh, West Texas. And he said, Lynn, he said, I need to talk to you here about a problem. He said, you know, I grew up out here in this county. I've been here in this county. He said, but, but one of the things I want to know is, he said, do you believe that it's wrong to, to have uh, wine with your, your meal or, or uh, anything like that? Well, of course it's wrong. Of course it is. And went through some of the same material. He said, you know, he said, I, I grew up in the Lord's Church. He said, my parents are Christians. He said, I never heard that. Never heard that. Of course, I'm wondering what congregation did he grow up in. And that surely proves, or, or at least in, in my mind, it sets forth uh, an alarm flag that our brethren in so many places are not dealing with the most fundamental uh, matters on Christian living and conduct at all and being unspotted from the world and drunkenness. All right, uh, 
Uh, perhaps somebody else would like to make a comment. You already made one. Okay. This is official. Gene Hill, Indianola, uh, Mississippi. Um, I did a correctional standards course for the Polk County Sheriff's Department in uh, Polk County, Florida, uh, 8081. And I was also a certified breathalyzer operator. Uh, one of the things we did in the, the correctional standards course required by the state of Florida was the, the things that Lynn is talking about. And there was a, 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 a box with a brake pedal and a, and a uh, gas pedal on it. And what the experiment was is they would give the volunteer a, uh, the, the drink of his choice. Every 15 minutes they'd give him a serving, whether it was a, a shot of whatever he wanted to drink or whether it was a beer, whether it was a glass of wine, the standard, standard dosage. And at the beginning of the, before they gave him any alcohol, the, this, this box, the instructor had a, a, a kill switch in his hand and there's light on top of the box that would be green and he'd hit the button, which would start a timer on the side of the box, outside of the vision of the person operating the pedals. The red light would flash on and he would have his foot on the gas. When the green light went off, red light went on, he'd take his foot off the brake and mash the gas pedal. And they would time it with a timer, hundreds, hundreds of a second. And they did that three times to get an average. And then they'd give him a drink. Fifteen minutes later, they'd do the test again three times. And you could see the, the, the uh, time increase from the time of the reaction time, taking the foot off the gas and hitting the brake and turning off the, the, the switch. Um, I, my wife and I obeyed the gospel in, in the early 75. And, you know, I had no problem with, with, with imbibing beverage alcohol, and, and I never heard any sermons on it until I went to the School of Preaching in Lakeland, Florida. And Brother Carr, the, the first day of class, he said, boys, we need to talk. We talked about dress, uh, we talked about conduct, and he says, and now about uh, beverage alcohol. And he just went down through the scriptures, as, as Lynn indicated, and just made a case for not imbibing. I don't talk about drinking. I talk about imbibing beverage alcohol. He made the scriptural case, and I haven't had, I have not imbibed beverage alcohol since then. Not because I was ever arrested, not because I ever had any problems with it, but simply because the Bible said. That was enough for me. Everybody agrees that, that one drink makes you drunk, whether it, and the problem is that some disagree whether it's the first one or the sixth one. But I would even go further than that, even closer to that. I would say the first sip, the first touching of the tongue to the beverage alcohol is your, whatever degree it is, you're that much drunken. And I've thrown too many people in jail. I've fought on the floor of the, of the Polk County Jail in the Lakeland Police Department with, with drunks. I've just seen too much of it. I have absolutely no sympathy for the drunk because no one ever had someone sit on their chest and force them to become an alcoholic, not the first person. I'm aware of. Uh, I'm sorry they're in that condition, but they made a choice. I regret they made that choice. I'll help them all I can, but it's they are there by their own choice. And it was point four or five. It took him three days to wake up. I guard him in Polk County Hospital. General Hospital. Yes, if I serve a ten-year sentence in Texas prison, you serve an eleven-year. No, I didn't. <laughs> okay, all right. No, I'm just I'm just messing with you, Gene. No, just messing with. You. Yes. You've got such a shelter life. That's Skip Francis, Liberal Kansas. Uh, what I wanted to take a, just a minute and mention is that we also have a, a positive way of dealing with this rather than a negative. So often people are looking for a thou shalt not. But we've forgotten that we have a word in the scriptures, the word sober. And interestingly enough, though sometimes it is... Uh, the underlying text means sober-minded. There are at least five examples in the Bible when we have a text that says to the Christian in general, "Be ye sober," and that word means free from intoxicants. There's just no way around that. Excellent point. Michael Hatcher from Pensacola. I think it's Ephesians 5.18 that uh, where it says, Be not drunk with wine. He uses the Greek tense, and I think Lee, you're the Greek expert around here right now, <laughs> that actually means do not even start the process of being drunk with wine in that case. 
Well, brethren, when we uh, look at this, I'm going to repeat the question just so I make sure that I've covered this and I appreciate all the comments. What's so wrong with having a glass of wine with your meal? You're not getting drunk. And I, I disagree with uh, the premise of the question there. You are, you are getting drunk. You are. What's wrong with it? Well, we want to then approach it and also with this uh, in mind, where's the authority to be a little bit drunk? It's the same place you can find authority to commit a little bit of fornication. I have a question in Texas. Uh, not only are our young people not being taught this, they're being taught the opposite. Um, I was sent uh, some tape sermons by Brother Jimmy Allen some six, seven or so years ago and was asked to review the material in the Gospel Journal, which I did. And he was advocating if you're in Rome, if you're in some other nation overseas, it's ridiculous to offend your host by not drinking wine with a meal. Jimmy Allen. Okay, and so then culture would trump the Bible uh, with that idea. All right, any other comments? Good comments? Anybody else who wants to follow up on that one? What does it mean to judge, and can we judge those who are not Christians? Well, to judge um, means, among other things, to separate and to select and to choose. Judge not that you be not judged, Matthew 7, verse 1. If people don't have a copy of the Bible in their homes, they still seem to know that particular phrase. And you can talk to somebody who is out here cussing like the proverbial sailor. My apologies to anybody who's uh, from the Navy here. But, but you, can, uh, you can find somebody who's cussing, and they may be uh, a womanizer, they it may be a drunken, um, a stumbling drunk at a casino in the middle of gambling. And if you walk up and you say, you're not a very spiritual person, <laughs> maybe this hypothetical person will turn around and say, judge not that you be not judged. And who are you to judge me? Well, the Bible um, teaches us the end that there's a judging that's forbidden. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and following. The harsh, censorious judgment, the end that uses a standard other than the Word of God and holds that person to a standard that, that, would, that um, the accuser would not want to be held to. The same Lord who uttered those words, though, Matthew 7 and 1 and following, also said, and it's recorded in John chapter 7, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Judge righteous judgment. Well, the standard of righteous judgment then has got to be the Word of God. And so from time to time, it is uh, imperative that we judge. We look at things. We do a discerning. We do a separation. We do a choosing. And we say, this is wrong. And this is right. How do we know right from wrong in matters of truth, then, in matters of uh, conduct? All these things we're talking about. It's just a matter of what does the Bible teach. It's a matter of then the Bible setting this forth. And when we say we're going to judge, I, I want to go just a little bit further than perhaps even the question um, has in mind or the questioner had in mind and just say that in, in this case, we're going to have to be able to determine First of all, between matters of opinion, we're going to have to judge between matters of opinion and matters of faith. One of the great debates that's taking place now uh, among brethren is uh, because some do not recognize the difference between obligatory matters from heaven and those matters that are matters of opinion, liberty, or expedience. And I thought about a cartoon, and I've been thinking about this for some time, but I I'd like you to just picture the cartoon with me. And here's a man, and behind this man are two rows of boxes, or two stacks of boxes. And over one, obligatory matters, or matters of faith is probably what we call it. And we would put on the edge of these boxes statements like um, the Lord's Supper, instrumental music, worship, the eldership, quali and qualification of elders and all that. I believe what some, and then over here is, uh, is a stack of boxes, and it says matters of opinion. For example, um, to meet at 9.30 or 10, to have carpeting, to have, um, or not, to meet um, in one building like this, or to meet in a rented hall, all these things.
And what some brethren are doing now, because it is more convenient for them as they judge, it makes it easier for them to judge something to be okay if they can move it from this stack over here to this stack. And so that's the idea behind the cartoon uh, there and the idea behind the illustration. But judging is required of every child of God. It must be according to God's standard. Elsewhere, it's not the same word that's used in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, or John chapter 7, but there's also a word that's used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, uh, Philippians chapter 1, and uh, about verses 8 and 9 uh, there. Prove all things, Paul said to the brethren in Thessalonica. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Prove all things. And there's a testing, an examination, a scrutinization that's to take place. And it is akin to, although it's not from the same word, it is akin to this, at least in effect. It is the idea of looking at things and testing them and proving them. Is this God's will in this matter? And so every single person, and this is not, again, this is not exclusively a responsibility of elders or preachers. But each and every one of us must engage in this type of judging, testing, scrutinization. And I might also mention this. Whenever a preacher preaches on a subject and someone then uh, continues to practice it, for example, on dancing, and uh, David may remember this particular event from some years ago, uh, there was someone at the uh, spring congregation, several of us went to see them, and their daughter had gone to dance. Her daughter has since been subject to church discipline, and I do not believe that she's repented. Um, but anyway, she went to a dance, and, um, and by the way, the parents did repent. But she was going over to this dance, and she was basically saying this, that we, I, I heard the sermon that was preached, and I think that David had preached just not too long, it was in the springtime, but not too long before the high school had its prom or something like that. And he preached against dancing. And she made the statement, and her parents were there egging her on, saying, well, we didn't agree with him at the time that he preached that. Well, I happen to know, because I inquired at the time, and he had never heard a word. The elders had never heard a word of objection. If you're in the pulpit, or if you're in the pew, you both have the same obligation to prove all things, to engage in judging of what is right and wrong. And once we engage in that judging and that proving, you have the same obligation, if I preach something that's not right, you have the same obligation that I do to preach truth to come and to correct me because I'm an error. You cannot, you do not biblically have the option to say, I don't agree. He taught that this was sin and I don't agree with him, but I'm going to let it go. You don't have that option from God. He's just not there. You're either going to have to correct me and I'm going to have to repent because I preached and called something sin that was not, or you're going to have to repent because you've been engaging in defending something that was sinful. And so those are the only two biblical options. All that's involved in judging. Now, the second part of that uh, question uh, says this, can we judge those who are not Christians? Well, Paul asked the question in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12, what are we to do, what are we to do with those, uh, judging those that are without? But remember also there in the context, and I'm assuming that's where this comes from, I'm not sure, of this part of the question, can we judge those who are not Christians? Uh, he's dealing here with the responsibility of the church, brothers and sisters, to one another. If any brother be named and doing one of these things, a fornicator, uh, uh, things like that. He said, now, is this is not all talking about those that are out in the world. He said, if that was the case, then you'd have to leave the world, wouldn't you? Because you may very well work around. You may very well sit down at a mealtime with a, a boss from your um, of work uh, who is engaged in fornication. You may not be aware of it. You might. But still, you're going to be teaching people as you have opportunity. And so he's not at all talking about withdrawing fellowship from those that are not in fellowship. He's talking about here the judging of brethren. They are based, again, once again, on God's inerrant standard and determining who is right. In this case, who is wrong, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And here we have a brother who is flagrantly, blatantly participating in sin. And so concerned not only for his soul, but also for the souls that might be influenced by this bad leaven, the church is to put away that wicked man from among uh, themselves. And there's a judging there that's commanded. Did you have a comment? Yes, Sorry. I'm Carl Ada from Pensacola. And I was wanting to comment on there earlier. I was discussing about the wine. 
and how people, like on David's lesson this morning about people saying, oh, I give up this, I give up that. Did they give anything up or was they getting rid of something that didn't belong to them anyhow? And people that want to use words that don't relate to the real meaning like wine, how many people that aren't homosexual would like to be called gay today? You know, they, they want to use things to for whatever they want, just like the the person with the cultural problem going someplace else and you know, it's offending them. How come it always has to be the Christian that has to compromise or give up his position for somebody else's trade or their uh, you know, just because they don't they're against it, so we have to give up what we're for to compromise or pacify them. Okay. Anybody else? Doug McClish Denton, Texas. Uh, what's always amazed me is the people who, as you say, if they've never heard of the Bible before, they know this phrase, judge not, should be not judged. They violate one of the elementary principles of Bible hermeneutics, and that is don't quit reading too soon. Just in the context, give not that which is holy unto the dogs, and cast not your pearls before the swine. Does that not require some judging of who is a two-legged dog or a two-legged pig? Okay. All right. Anyone else on that? All right. Why is the MacDever doctrine a fellowship issue? I'm not asking if it is wrong or not. Well, there are, uh, again, several here that really I'd like to, uh, to hear them comment on this because they're going to have some um, uh, ways of putting it that will be far superior to how I can put it. But I'm going to put it simply because, as one lady told me after I got through with a gospel meeting and I was preaching in Missouri some years ago, she said, Oh, Brother Park, you have the simplest mind I've ever heard. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll, I'll take that. And being simple-minded here, I'm going to uh, uh, answer it this way. And I was looking for a book earlier because I wanted to use the Deber Lockwood uh, debate. And there was a chart in there that dealt with a young man. And I can't quote it exactly, but the chart basically dealt with a young man trying to, de to resist sexual temptation and the fact that the Holy Spirit would help him, enable him to overcome this if, in fact, he did not have that or if he was subject to that temptation. Whenever we talk about uh, then the Deaver Doctrine, just a quick definition, and some of you again can summarize it probably much better than I can, but, it, but it's just this, that the Deaver Doctrine says that in addition to the Word, in conjunction with the Word, but still directly on the heart, the Holy Spirit enables or empowers or helps the child of God. Is that a pretty good summary of, uh, of, of what they believe? It's in conjunction, but still directly on the heart directly on the heart. There's several charts um, that I think about, and I always think of charts, and I think of cartoons, and I think of illustrations, again, because of the simple mind, but it also helps me to be able to see things and put them down. And I think uh, about this one, and uh, someone else uh, came up with this, and I thought he really did a great job on it. And it's got someone running a Christian race, and this person, this, this child of God is running, and they get almost to the finish line and and then the Holy Spirit helps them in those areas in which they cannot so that they can finish the race. Now I am not at all denying God's providence. I believe and I rejoice in the providence of God. I believe in the power of prayer. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous does indeed avail much. I know then our God answers the prayers of His faithful children. I know that. I believe that we must be a prayerful people. We do then depend on God to take care of us because in Him we live and move and have our very being. Uh, I know that some of us have been accused of being deists. Some of us have been accused of not believing in the power of prayer, not believing in God's providence, 
or not crediting God with uh, this or with perhaps saying that we know more of what's going on among Godhead uh, than, uh, than the Bible reveals. But regardless of, of the uh, false charges there, still theirs is that here is someone and he's grappling, at least in that chart, and this is the, the vivid imagery I have, he's grappling with a sin and on his own he's not going to be able to do that. Uh, he's not going to be able to overcome and the Holy Spirit is going to enable him. Now this only would be available to the child of God according to the Deber doctrine. It would not be available to the non-Christian. Isn't that right? Is that a fair representation? Okay. And so now you have the child of God needing more help to stay saved than this person outside of Christ needs to become saved. Well, not only that, there was a discussion between someone who I counted as a very, very dear friend. And some years ago, you know that Brother Bob Berard changed his position on what he believed. And there were times, uh, perhaps naively, that I thought that I might be able to talk with him and persuade him. And so there were some late nights there at spring just before he departed. He'd already been removed from his position there. And, of course, some of these things we were just finding out about. And we were just becoming uh, aware of what he was believing. And even then, I think all of us have seen that the Deber Doctrine has continued to evolve. And it's not necessarily remained static. It's, it's changed dramatically and not, for, not in any good way. But he said one time in his office, and we had a, a pretty lively discussion. I'll just characterize it that way. He said, Lynn, grant for a moment that you're facing a temptation that you cannot overcome. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. He said, no, don't interrupt me. I said, but I got to. He said, just grant it. He said, grant it for argument. I said, but Bob, you're asking me to grant something the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, will not, cannot happen. You're, you're setting a premise here. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 just makes the assurance to the Christian that God is faithful and He will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able to bear and will, with the temptation, make also a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Now, is that a firm, ironclad guarantee by God? Absolutely it is. And so the premise that begins with you're going to face temptation that you can't handle is in, in itself right there from the get-go. It's false. It's wrong. But then Brother Terry Hightower did a masterful job in bringing up this and emphasizing it uh, in a great fashion uh, a few years ago. And he says, so when in fact you falter, you sin, whose fault was it? Is it yours? Or did the Holy Spirit, at least in part, fail you? And is he not responsible? Now, the questioner says, not, not asking if it's wrong or not, why is it a fellowship issue? And here's what I see from a very simple approach. It's a fellowship issue because it's going to lead people to believe that when they sin, it wasn't their fault after all. Really, the Flip Wilson idea, the devil made me do it. Or the Holy Spirit didn't stop me. And I remember very distinctly when I was up in Virginia having a Bible study with uh, a man and we talked about some worldly habits that he had. Among those worldly habits, he mentioned smoking and drinking. And he said, the Holy Spirit had just not led me yet to become convicted that I need to give those up. And he said, when he communicates that to me, he said, then I will. And of course, I tried to show him that the Holy Spirit has already communicated that right here through the written word. But he was not uh, satisfied with that. Um, I went and found a book, and Michael said he'd been looking for it in y'all's library. And by the way, if you want me to find any other lost books for you, just let me know, because here it is, uh, there in your library, and um, by Curtis Cates. Does the Holy Spirit operate directly upon the heart of a sinner? And uh, it's interesting to go through here and to see what brethren have believed and the positions, and he did a good job of documenting past positions of folks, including the Deepers, on this. That shows that they have changed and oppose what they once stood for in that. Now, it'll be really interesting to see how all this shakes out over the next uh, uh, months and coming years and things like that. Uh, there, But still, you look upon this and what you're going to see is that if I believed that the Holy Spirit was going to directly impact and influence me and help enable me, help and enable me 
to overcome sin in that crucial moment when I'm faced with temptation, I may not really look for the way of escape. Now, perhaps some others can do um, um, a good job of straightening out everything that I see. David Brown, Spring, Texas. Talk about it continuing to evolve. Uh, I think most here are aware. It's only been in recent years that they've uh, taken the position that there is a Holy Spirit baptism that is essential to one becoming a Christian today. And what they teach on that is that when you're being baptized, you're baptized with water and the Spirit. Well, what they mean by that is, is that you're baptized in the water in obedience to the gospel to gain remission of sins. But to be baptized of the Spirit, then you're under that water. While you're under that water, and that means you haven't been raised to walk near of life yet. You have, you're still in your sin, no matter how, what you're intending to do and what's in the process of being done. When you're under the water, you have not been raised to walk near of life. But while you're under that water, then the Holy Spirit directly comes up on you to destroy whatever it is that's been polluted by sin for the purpose of when you rise from water to river baptism, thus freed from sin because you've been baptized from this of sin. And this is their view of the gift of the Holy Spirit of Acts 2, 38. That then your hearts had been cleansed, your inward man's been cleansed, then the Holy Spirit can come in to take up His abode and therefore do what you all have been talking about in this enabling business. When we were trying to get Brother Mac to debate a number of months ago, we offered to debate the baptismal measure that he is advocating today. We did that because what you've been discussing here cannot take place in their doctrine unless the person has been baptized in the Holy Spirit while he was under the water physically. Because it's by that action that allows the Holy Spirit, per their false doctrine, to come then in and, and, and dwell uh, and do directly what you've been discussing here. So he's created a situation to where actually... You don't even have to discuss this except to refute it and to understand what they're actually saying. You don't even have to discuss the direct enabling thing. Because if you don't have this baptism of the Holy Spirit that they advocate now takes place when you are baptized in water, the other can't happen. And this is why Bob Berard, not long before he died or was killed in, 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 uh, rather in Cambodia, he was baptized again. Now, that's rather interesting. I would like to know whether MacDever has been baptized a second time now that he has come to a deeper understanding of what must take place when one is under the waters of baptism. Does this mean then that Brother Roy Deaver, just being baptized like we all understand the Bible taught, to be baptized for the remission of sins, does that mean he's lost? Does that mean that everybody where Mac preaches must be baptized with that in mind, what I've just explained. And I'm not trying to misrepresent him. I'm saying exactly what he teaches. I'm not, I know I am. I, I know it that well. Uh, I may make this suggestion as a sideline. Don't ever enter into debate with anybody. Do you know his doctrine as well as he knows it? If you don't, you're going to be in fine hot water. The problem is sometimes in this development of this doctrine, I know Mac pretty well on things like this. He will let you believe a number of things that he hasn't already got worked out or else he believes something different on it. I know he was doing that during the Lockwood debate. I know he was doing that because he was working these particular things out. Now the question is, was the Holy Spirit guiding him to do that in view of his teaching on the enablement and direct work and all this kind of extracurricular activity that's not his responsibility? I would therefore conclude that uh, any doctor, talking about obligatory matters, we want to fellow it we should never fall out of fellowship on matters that have nothing to do with obligatory things. Things we must do to be saved. Things we must do to remain saved. And if somebody comes along and binds something on us as a human will saying that's obligatory when it's not, then we've got grounds for 
matters of lack of fellowship too. But I would be willing to say in this that certainly it's a violation of an obligatory matter to teach a doctrine that allows a person to think that when I've done all that I could, it's insufficient. I must have the Holy Spirit to step in and do this to me, to strengthen me with strength from heaven, which strength I don't have as a mere human being, to comply with what God said I must comply with in order to be faithful. Now therefore, it goes back to what you said earlier. If a person who as far as anybody knows is faithful to God and all the New Testament says a, a, a Christian is and he's faithful, if that person falls from grace, whose fault is it? And tell me why the, at the judgment bar of God in view that this is for everybody, for the good of the church, to strengthen them, then uh, why are you sending me to hell? The Holy Spirit is the one that failed me. You gave me the promise that the Holy Spirit to take up where I can't handle it. And now this question comes right home to mind. In view of the fact that his youngest son, Todd Deaver, has denied the whole New Testament pattern of New Testament Christianity and denied everything we preached here virtually this week as far as having to have Bible authority mm -hmm. and the proper way to write and abide the Word of Truth. Uh, he's the one that helped convince Mac on this baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit I just explained. I want to ask something. Whose fault in that he's taken up this position? Is it the Holy Spirit letting him down? Or is it his fault? That's why these things are highly significant and why they're matters of fellowship. And that's just beginning to touch him with Dharma. And, and just one other thing. David, you're going to remember this letter. Do you remember a letter when I was cleaning out Bob Rard's material after he'd already left the spring premises? I said, I found this. I don't think Bob intended to leave this behind. It was from Mac Deaver to Bob Rard. I provided you a copy when you were preparing for the Daniel Denham debate uh, with Mac. And in that, Mac questions the validity of every single one of your baptism if you didn't have the same understanding on the Holy Spirit that he did when you were baptized. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess you got that available. Yeah, we, we still got it. Here. Yeah. So very interesting. Here's a quick quote. I mentioned this book. Here's a quick quote. It's been pointed out very clearly in this work that the pioneers rejected Calvinistic theology, which included the direct, miraculous work of the Holy Spirit on the heart of the child of God in conjunction with the Word. The pioneers soundly refuted that faithful, destructive error. They exalted the all-sufficient Word. It's been shown also in the last several decades. Some have insisted on going back into post-baptismal Calvinism, some even to full-blown Calvinism. Any degree of Calvinism is fatal error. Faithful brethren cannot and will not fellowship it. Go see. Faithful brethren won't. We'll, we'll just, just put a memory peg there. All right. Um, and one last comment, and then we've got to end. Mike, I'm Michael Hatcher from Woodsville. No, we're all ready over time. Another reason it's a fellowship matter is they deny that the Bible can do what the Bible says it can do. The Bible says that the word of His grace is able to build you up and give you an inheritance. They say it can't. They deny the Bible. Hey, brethren, I don't want to sound like a book review, but years ago, um, it was 33 years ago, I sat in a one-week class by Franklin Camp. And uh, that was one of the richest weeks of my life. And I became familiar with Brother Camp. I'd never heard of him before then. He came to Dallas, Texas uh, then. I just want to say this, that, that all of some brethren, that's what I always happens when you've got a lot of preachers around, but when, although some brethren uh, may disagree with some of the conclusions in here, this would go a long way to edify the brethren if you would get this book out of the libraries and study it. The Work of the Holy Spirit in Redemption by Franklin Kemp. Really, brethren, um, we need to go back and get even our young people to cutting their teeth on good, solid preaching and, and Bible material, Bible study material like this. No, if you can make it about one minute, and then David, you can make that comment about this book. Doug uh, McClatchy in Texas. Uh, Lynn has sort of cryptically said, "Let's keep our eyes on this uh, matter of Brother Cates' criticism of this doctrine and where Brother Cates is going to end up with Matt Deaver." Um, within the past two months, Brother Cates has recommended for a debate 
that a young brother who contacted him contact Dave Miller to be the debater against the Baptist. In turn, the young man contacted Brother Dave Miller, and Brother Miller recommended he contact Brother Mac Deaver to do the debating. So, Brother Cates now is standing behind Brother Miller. Brother Miller clearly has no problems with Brother Mac Deaver, regardless of his Holy Spirit errors. He thinks that Brother Deaver would be a, uh, a worthy representative of the truth against Baptist false doctrine. So, the uh, lines are already being blurred there considerably, it seems to me, between where Brother Cates was and where he is. And when the young man contacted Brother Cates again, he said, I'm surely disappointed, Brother Miller. Oops. Oops. What, what, do, we, what do we do? Add a, add a last chapter? Oops. Okay. Right. David was going to make one comment. And he brought up the book that made me think of it from uh, Brother Camp. This was before any of us had any idea that the Deavers believed any more than the personal indwelling, period. And uh, that was when Brother Deaver was still at Southwest. We were all over there. We talked about 20 years ago or more. And he made the statement to me because we had some discussion on just from the standpoint of the Holy Spirit dwelling personally or representatively, but even not much of that. That's all that anybody knew the differences were in those days, in the church anyway. But uh, Brother Deaver told me when I brought up, however it came up about Brother Camp's book, I'd had it for many years at that point. He said, yes. I wrote Brother Camp and I begged him not to write and publish that book. Now you can take that for whatever it's worth and do what is taught in that. And if you haven't got Brother Camp's book, you need it. Okay, please. Thirty seconds. Uh, Wayne Blake, uh, Huntsville, Texas. If it is the case that the Holy Spirit has to enlighten you to have understanding, then where does Brother Deaver get his understanding? If you have to be rebaptized in order to have the Holy Spirit work directly on you, where does he get that? The better question might be at this point in time, where did Todd Deaver get his information? Was the Holy Spirit directly helping him? That's the doctrine, but and yet he was ready to debate Todd Deep. And did the Spirit direct him to debate the one who said that the Spirit is helping them? Hmm. Which one really has a Spirit then? Well, we appreciate all the comments. Uh, the questions we went a little over time, but uh, these are serious matters and they do need to be discussed.